Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. By the travelers, nearly 40 million Americans benefit from our insurance, investment services, and managed health care. The travelers. And by MFS. MFS, helping mutual fund and institutional investors achieve their financial goals since 1924. And by Prudential Securities, rock solid market wise. Prudential Securities, celebrating 10 years on television with Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Produced Friday, July 24. Guest host is Frank Cappiello. Our panelists are Eddie Brown, Mary Farrell, and William Gross. Tonight's special guest is Alan J. Folkman, Portfolio Manager, Columbia Special Fund. Good evening. I'm Frank Cappiello. Louis Rukeyser is on vacation, so I'll be your host tonight. Welcome back. Folks, I'm going to make you a promise. I know, I know. You've been hearing promises all year, and frankly, you're sick of them. But tonight is going to be different. I, Frank Cappiello, being of sound mind and body, but don't ask my wife, promise that not once will I mention the word. Read my lips. E-L-E-C-T-I-O-N. Yes, election. You've heard it here first. Besides, there are more interesting things going on this week such as the Olympics, which start today. Forgetting the obvious superstars for a moment, it'll be nice to see your average, everyday American competing for nothing more than the love of the game, with a chance to put a medal around his or her neck. Take Michael Plum, 52 years old, and in his eighth Olympics. Or Travis West, who just four years ago was in a coma that seemed irreversible. And today, he's in Barcelona. They both have won gold medals in my book. Unfortunately, the economic news didn't produce a lot of medal winners this week, but we'll give out a few. First, give a gold to durable goods orders, which pole vaulted in June to their highest level in 10 months. And also mortgage rates, dropping to 8% and lower in some cities. And a silver goes to steel imports. Although they fell in May, they're still above last year's levels. Finally, a bronze goes to Alan Greenspan, who predicted that the economy will pick up, but just couldn't say in which century. And our non-metal performers, banks and savings institutions whose deposit rates continue to nosedive, the federal budget, although showing a surplus in June, is on track for a record deficit, the California banks, after cashing $1 billion worth of IOUs from the state, said no more, and the corporate controllers who reported that only 17% of their companies expect to hire over the next six months. We tonight will talk with a man who gets big results by thinking small. But first, let's check out the wrestling done on Wall Street in a week just past. The Dow Jones Industrial Average joined the other world markets as stocks tumbled earlier in the week amid investors' worries about a plunging dollar and other global problems. The Dow eked out small gains on Tuesday and Thursday, but fell almost 46 points for the week to close at 3285.71. And the broader markets followed suit, with the New York Stock Exchange, the S&P 500, and NASDAQ falling after three weeks of gains. The week's turmoil was enough to unnerve one of our elves, Stan Weinstein. He changed his stance from neutral to bearish, putting the reading at neutral. Its first change in seven weeks. The dollar rebounded to post gains against all major currencies too. But gold is shining up five straight weeks as well as T-bonds which reached this week the highest level of this year. And one bit of news, the average stockbroker in the nation pocketed over $98,000 last year, a new compensation record. These guys can buy their own gold medals. Mary Farrell, What's it going to take to get this market moving up? 
I think once again the crucial issue is earnings. You know, first quarter we had some pleasant surprises as the economy surprised us. Second quarter the economy's disappointed. It didn't maintain that strength of the first quarter. And the second quarter earnings are coming in once again disappointing. So I think we're going to have to see better evidence that this recovery is going to continue and bring corporate earnings along with it. Uh, is there a chance that we're going to be disappointed and that uh, the earnings won't come through and then the market you know, cascades downwards, say to 31, 30, 33,000? I think there is a chance that there'll be disappointment across the cyclical range. A lot of people have some high expectations for the cyclical companies because they usually do get those big earning spurts coming out of a recession. I think here with the very slow growth, and we'd expect better growth in the third and fourth quarter, but not robust growth. Mm -hmm. So I think what you'll see is, is the, the interest in the cyclicals um, unwinding somewhat and shifting back to the growth stocks that can show good gains. Bill Gross, uh, the interest rate trend has been remarkable for the past, really, two years. Uh, are we at the bottom? I mean, can you see treasuries now, 30-year uh, treasuries at 7 instead of 7 and 5 eighths where they ended this week? You know, Frank, I think we're at the bottom for uh, short-term interest rates for anything between six months and perhaps five or six years. The one remaining sector uh, that has value in the marketplace in terms of the yield curve is the long treasury bond that you mentioned, currently at 7.5%. Now there's a bond that uh, basically is yielding 4 to 5 percent more than inflation and I think there's still some room for long-term rates to come down. But on the short side, we've basically reached bottom. Well, on the long side, isn't it true that the reason why these long rates have persisted in staying up is because the money people, the institutional investors, are really saying we want to be paid for expected future inflation. We're worried about inflation. And until we see something that inflation won't be a problem in the, past, in the next couple of years, we're opting out. Well, I think that's part of the problem, but of course inflation has behaved itself and is down in the two and a half to three percent range. The other reason has to do with foreign interest rates. Interest rates in Germany and France and England are in the nine and ten percent area on the short-term side and in eight to nine percent range on the long-term side, and those rates act as a magnet to U.S. interest rates. It draws money from the U.S. over to Europe. When those rates come down, when Germany lowers its key interest rates, and I think that will happen later in the year, then U.S. long rates can finally come down to the 7 and perhaps as low as the 6.5% range. Great. Eddie Brown, uh, one of the more remarkable things that happened this week is gold. Gold is up now for the fifth week in a row. Um, gold usually has a message when it moves up like that. Is there a message here? Is it just a, a normal reaction? I don't really follow that market very closely, Frank. I think um, gold, when people are concerned um, about foreign issues, it's kind of a haven, or if they're concerned about maybe inflation heating up, and um, I don't really know of a good reason why it'd be moving. Well, what about the stock market? Are you investing now? Are you putting money into the market? You know, there's the argument of whether the market is overpriced, or underpriced, and I think uh, I come down on the side that the market is not overpriced. And the reason is, uh, if you look at earnings estimates for next year, it's selling at maybe 15 to 16 times next year's earnings. The yield is fairly low at around 3%, but that's okay, you know, in the context of other low rates. So I come down that the market is not overpriced, and um, you get into the argument of cyclical stocks or companies that move with the economy have been doing very well. Growth stocks have not been doing very well. But there are many exceptions. If you look at companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Office Depot, what they have in common is that they have not disappointed. And if they can exceed expectations, uh, I think you know the market in general and many companies will still do very well. So you'd be buying the Home Depots and the Walmarts right now? Oh, uh, they're pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have them, I would hold them. If you didn't um, have them, <laughs> what I would, would you I buy? Would, I would nibble. <laughs> You would nibble. I would nibble. Okay. I think uh, two areas that are very mm -hmm. interesting still would be the bank stocks, uh, something like MNC Financial, mm -hmm. uh, Bank of uh, Boston, for example, good regional companies that's turning around, have already turned, and uh, some of the um, nursing home stocks, like mm -hmm. Beverly Enterprises, a restructured company, and healthcare and retirement are the sixth largest nursing home company. So there are some areas of the market I think you can still make good money. Do you think there's some areas, Mary, where you can still make some money here? 
Absolutely, and again, I, I'd go back to some of the growth stocks that have, as, as Eddie said, been beaten down in the first half. It's put them at nice prices, and it's a good opportunity to, to get a growth that's twice what the market's going to show. And do you have some names? Very quickly? Yes, uh, the, glo the global growth stocks. I mean, we have a recession here. We're moving into slow growth, but there's tremendous growth overseas. Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Philip Morris, they all are showing uh, growth rates which really reflect far better uh, um, ability to grow than we see just here in our own economy. Uh, Bill Gross, it's unfair to ask you about stocks, but how about international bonds? Are there any favorites that you would have, countries? Oh, I, I think the markets in Germany and France, uh, England as well, are, are uh, soon to, uh, to appreciate in price and interest rates coming down very quickly. There are a number of uh, global funds um, on the New York Stock Exchange, closed-in funds which the investor can participate in, so I'd suggest some of those. Okay. All righty. It's nine, time now for our panelists to jumpstart our viewers on the road to financial success. So we'll start with you, Mary Farrell. A lot of individual investors have to eventually make a difficult choice, such as when to start seeking professional financial advice. Sol Weiss of MassPath New York wonders just that and would also appreciate any other suggestions you might have on the subject. Okay. I think when seeking professional advice sooner rather than later is what you should do. Uh, when you're looking ahead to funding education or retirement, the sooner you start, the easier it is and more effective. Also, for tax and estate planning, you can save substantial amounts of money by getting started. The second half is much more difficult. Whom do you choose? And I think there I'd say really do your homework. Seek a, a trusted recommendations interview whoever you're interested in, make sure they understand your goals, make sure they listen to you and they're willing to work with you uh, so that you feel the confidence. Professional advice can save you from a lot of the pitfalls, but also uh, reap better rewards. Okay. Bill Gross, Gary Kindler of Minneapolis, Minnesota is another individual investor with a question concerning issues of new stocks. He writes, I've read that before they are offered to the general public, they are offered to the brokerage houses, preferred clients and institutional clients. Hmm. How can I, as an individual investor, gain access to these new issues before they are second-hand issues? Well, let's tell the truth, Bill. All right, Frank. As you know, it's a, it's a jungle out there when it comes to initial public offerings You're and back. their distribution. Uh, the bigger lions get the first pieces of meat, so to speak. Uh, but there are several things that can be done with uh, the small investor. First of all, you can get a list of the initial public offerings in a daily newspaper or from your broker himself and simply call and call and call until he's tired of you calling. Wear him down, so to speak. Uh, then if you can't beat them, uh, perhaps you should join them. And I'm talking about uh, perhaps buying into a mutual fund that does participate substantially in initial public offerings. They would be the, the high-tech types of uh, mutual funds that buy those types of issues. So two things to do. Good. Okay. Ed Brown, how would you respond to Nancy Goldman of Chevy Chase, Maryland, who writes as follows. For many years, I've noticed that all of my eyeliner pencils and lipstick liner pencils of all shades and prices and all cosmetic companies, whether French, Italian, Japanese, British, or American, bear an imprint stating made in West Germany, which I presume will be updated to made in the Federal Republic of Germany. I believe I can safely guess that these items are all manufactured by one company which appears to have cornered the world's market in cosmetic liners. Can someone tell me the name of this company and how I can get in on this great deal? <laughs> <laughs> tell me too. Okay. Uh, I don't use the products. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's quite universal, however, but um, there are two companies in West Germany that's in the business. One is called Schwann Stabilo, S-T-A-B-I-L-L-O. -L -L the other is called Faber Castell. However, they're both private companies, so she can't get in on the deal. Okay. But um, she has the best approach to finding good investment ideas, and that is, as a user of a product, um, try to find out. Exactly. Okay. Now, if you'd like to change the makeup of your portfolio and line your billfold with some profits, don't change your face. Pucker up and change the face of your broker instead. You can start by penciling in your money questions to us here at Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, let's take a look at the three investment strategies he uses that have made him one of the top portfolio managers of the past five years, as we see how special it is to be small. Our guest invests over half of his portfolio in long-term growth stocks. They are small and medium-sized companies who have shown strong industry leadership have low debt with high equity, 
and small institutional ownership. He also likes companies where management owns lots of stock. With the other half of the fund, he puts 45% in market-responsive companies. These are shorter-term investments of different industrial sectors that are price-sensitive. They may also be cyclicals, meaning whichever direction the market takes, they follow. And lastly, 1% goes towards special situations. These companies are turnarounds. They may have been involved in takeovers, mergers, buyouts, or restructuring. Although undervalued at present, they could produce big profits later on. The remaining 4% he keeps in cash. How golden is this three-step rule? And more importantly, can it work for us? For some thoughts on that, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, Alan J. Folkman. Hi, Alan. Hello, Frank. Welcome. Thank Please you. Sit down. Nice to be here. As one of the largest investors in the fund he manages, Alan Folkman is a lot riding on its success. And he's done pretty well, too. The Columbia Special Fund is up over 78% for the past five years. Its assets are above $300 million. To top it off, he lives far away from the madness of Wall Street in Portland, Oregon. Mr. Folkman joined Columbia Management Company in 1975 and took over the Special Fund six years ago. Alan, last year was a great year for what we call small size stocks. Uh, this year, they seem to have lost their momentum. When will they regain it? When will we see small stocks go up again? Well, 1991 was an exceptional year. Uh, most small stocks were up 40 to 50%. However, that came after seven years of very poor performance. So I think as uh, stocks usually do, it got a little bit uh, too popular and they had a well-deserved rest. However, I think the conditions that were present that caused the interest in the first place are still there. We, we, we hear a lot about small stocks, medium-sized stocks, large stocks. Uh, what are we talking about? I mean, how would the average investor distinguish between them? I think the generally accepted definition of small cap stocks are 500 million in capitalization size or less. It's kind of a gray area from 500 to a, to a billion. Generally, uh, up to about one and a half billion are considered the medium cap stocks. So that general range of under 500, 500 to a billion and a half. And the capitalization would be the price of the stock times the number of shares. Number of shares, right. Right. Uh, do you own any big cap stocks? We own a few big mm -hmm. cap stocks, and the uh, amount we own vary with market conditions. Mm -hmm. We use big cap stocks to help stabilize the portfolio during uh, tough times. Sometimes when cash flow is rapid and the, the, the uh, stocks in the small to medium-sized category aren't as, uh, aren't as parent that we want to use, we'll use big cap stocks to give us uh, a cash substitute and still participation in the market. While you're waiting for the small, small right. cap stocks. Uh, you carry about, what, 100 plus uh, stocks in your portfolio? Right now there are 116, 116. and I think 100 to 120 is the, the range that we would use. Give us the names of a couple of stocks you bought recently, like in the past month. Well, in the past couple of months, uh, we bought uh, one bigger cap stock that's in the, the couple of billion size category, Medco Containment, which has been a very good stock, uh, great earnings performance, is in that cost containment field for medical costs, the mail order pharmacy. Uh, that stock declined in price with the multiple compression in some of the growth stocks to an area that we thought was attractive. We bought that one. Uh, just two or three months ago, we bought a retailer in the Midwest called Kohl's, K-O-H-L-S, which is a, uh, a chain of about 80 stores in the Midwest that is kind of the Walmart of soft goods. They are, uh, sell uh, department store kinds of apparel and soft goods with name brand merchandise, growing mm -hmm. about 20% of year. Well, I can see why you bought Medco Containment. It has all the ingredients we talked about earlier in the graphic, and it did come down in price, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, gave you a bargain. Uh, Kohl's, I guess, the, the thesis here is, again, value merchandising. Uh, was the price cheap, or, or are you paying up for this? One of the things I think is very important in this marketplace is, uh, is to be a low-cost producer, and it was a new issue mm -hmm. that uh, seemed priced, uh, was it priced attractively, and is growing selling low, uh, selling name brand merchandise at lower cost uh, to the consumer and it is in a geographical area that's relatively strong and has uh, a lot of expansion potential 
Well, we're in this geographical area right now. We have some strong panelists, too. <laughs> so let me turn you over to Mary Farrell okay. for a moment. Alan, you mentioned that seven years of underperformance. During that time, one of the fastest growing mutual fund areas was global growth funds from other markets. Uh, it appeared to have taken away some of the demands from small stocks. As you look ahead to the 90s, uh, do you think last year was the beginning of a, of a seven years outperformance, or do you think you're still going to have so much diversion? No, I think it is the beginning of a long performance. Um, most studies uh, have shown that over a long period of time, small stocks have outperformed big stocks by about 2%. And there's, there's no reason, I think, that that will not continue. Right now, small stocks are selling about two multiple points cheaper than big stocks. Mm -hmm. um, they, be, by the very nature of their size, can grow faster. One of the reasons, I think, contributed to the underperformance with big cap stocks is big cap stocks had more international exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, benefited more from an export-driven economy. Also, interesting enough, uh, tax rates came down more for big cap stocks than they did small cap. Mm -hmm. So some of those conditions have been corrected, and I think that we'll, again, assume a, a leadership position. Mm -hmm. Alan, when an individual is buying a small cap stock, other than through a mutual fund, is there any uh, particular pitfall you would avoid and recommend avoiding for them? Well, I think the, uh, the pitfall may be buying a, a fad or... Uh, emotion rather than looking at the management, the stability of the, the company and its product, its market share leadership, uh, the strength of its balance sheet. Those kinds of issues are very important with small stocks and I think to avoid buying because someone else is buying or it's a, it's a faddish kind of a, of a company or product that it's selling. Alan, in the small company area, when you look at your big winners and your big losers, what were some of the common elements in each case? Well, the interesting thing, uh, we had two, the two biggest winners in the portfolio have similar characteristics. One of them was uh, Dahlberg, which is a hearing aid manufacturer, and the other is Bombay, which sells uh, early American uh, or antique uh, furniture reproductions in malls. Uh, both of them had the characteristic of having something unique that the marketplace needed and wanted and we've owned both of those for six years and stayed with them and they're both up uh, about four times. The losers are ones where we really didn't respond as quickly as we should have to uh, changing product leadership, changing market conditions. Good. Speaking about losers, I, one of the most difficult things that we all have in the stock market is when to sell. Now, the trend had to be in effect for you to say this stock is is not doing what I expected. But what are some of the warning signals, Alan, that you get so that you don't write a stock down 60 or 70 percent? Well, the first thing that comes to your attention is losing momentum in the stock price itself. In the price, yeah. The stock price is not, uh, not performing the way you would think it should perform. That's a warning to look at other things. Other things would be losing uh, market share, management changes, um, just a change in the focus of the, of the company. Those are all warning signals, uh, profit margins that are mm -hmm. declining. You don't think it's a disadvantage to be living 3,000 miles from Wall Street in Portland, Oregon? No, we get, at, get asked that question frequently, and uh -huh. we think that it's really somewhat of an advantage in that it gets you further away from this uh, forest where there's a lot of emotion uh -huh. and, uh, and following of, of others involved to give us a little viewpoint. Plus, another important factor is it really gives us a chance to attract very capable people who want the the uh, living environment that Portland, Oregon offers them. Uh, you have six children. Right. Uh, all of your money is invested in, in, the, in your fund. Um, isn't that worrisome? Don't you uh, give that a lot of thought about such concentration? Well, I have, I have two focuses to my own money. Uh -huh. One is half of it's in uh, tr U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh -huh. And the other half's in Columbia Special Fund, so I have the oh, safety, you're a little and tricky. <laughs> safety and stability of the, uh, the uh -huh. treasuries and then the market long-term growth potential of the special fund. When you get a little, uh, when you get bullish, do you lower the treasuries or do you always keep that 50-50? No, I've uh, kept that pretty, oh, uh, pretty close, right. Alan, a lot of people look at, at uh, portfolio managers and they say, gee, I'd like to be a portfolio manager. Uh, what does it take to be a portfolio manager? How would a young man or woman starting out, just getting out of school, uh, march that path upward to portfolio management position? Unfortunately, it's a, it's a fairly tough field to enter. But also profitable. Once you're there, 
<laughs> once you're there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of mobility to uh -huh. move around. But the, uh -huh. I would say the entry point, uh, first of all, the education is important. And then uh, the entry point for most people are with uh, banks who might train uh, uh, analysts, usually in research and uh, insurance companies, big mutual fund complexes. Usually most people, I think, get experience as an analyst and then gradually work in uh, research analyst and then work into the portfolio management field. Do you have any potential portfolio managers in your family? I've got one. My oldest son wants to be uh, do what I do right now. He's a senior in college. Wonderful. Okay. I hate to interrupt, but our time is up, and I want to thank our guest, Alan Falkman, and our panelists uh, for joining us tonight. And I hope you'll be back with us again next week when Louis Rukeyser returns and his guest will be a technical market analyst from St. Louis. He's Alfred Goldman of A.G. Edwards and one of the nation's leading elves. He'll share his views on whether this cool down market can get the fires burning again. It should be a blast. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. I'm Frank Cappiello. Good night and good luck. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser has been made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. By the Travelers, providing American business with insurance, investment services, and managed health care. The Travelers. And by MFS. MFS, helping mutual fund and institutional investors achieve their financial goals since 1924. And by Prudential Securities, rock-solid market-wise. Prudential Securities, celebrating 10 years on television with Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to Transcripts. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Transcripts are also available to subscribers of the Dow Jones News Retrieval Service.